All right, four o'clock, week 10, last week of instruction. Yes, you made it. I've not had a single person drop any of my classes yet. This is a, a, a miracle considering the current situation. So good job for you guys. Stick with it. We're almost done, all right? One last week. Question, do you play Among Us? Very sus. No, I, I do not play Among Us. Sorry, I've heard of it, but I don't have any idea how to play it. So um, that's like the game where you all hang out together and, and you're outside, right? And you're like, you know, partying and no, that's that's not it. Okay. How do we like the meme today? This is a very common thing for me when I'm making up homeworks. Three plus seven. Ah, oh, I better get to the calculator. Yeah. Um, since we're having our exam soon, I thought this would be a good one to slip in there. All right, a couple of announcements. Homework number seven uh, on failure theories of thin laminates has been posted. I'm not going to collect that or grade that, but it's posted with full solution. You're going to have some final exam question related to failure theory for thin laminates. So you got to take a look at that. You got to know what's going on there. All right. Also, I've uploaded the um, exam study guide for the final. Uh, again, that's more of like qualitative type stuff. Um, so make sure you take a look at that. There's some detail there about things I think you should know. And then finally, your final exams Thursday, uh, 2 to 4 p.m. I think it's 2 to 4 p.m., right? Yeah. And we'll have that on Teams. So that'll take place just like the last exam, except it'll be two hours this time instead of 50 minutes. So expect some more long form calculation type questions that I didn't really have time to dive in on too much for the first test. OK, not as much qualitative stuff this time around, a lot more quantitative stuff. So get ready for that. All right. Got all your manufacturing documents graded. So if you haven't gotten yours back for whatever reason and you think you turned one in, then um, talk to me. All right. So I hope you wore your math pants today because we're about to get mathy. And if you like what we do, some of you might like what we do today. Some of you might not. If you like what we do, you're cut off for graduate school. If not, um, maybe uh, still go to graduate school. <laughs> OK, because you can do it. All right, let's pick up where we left off. So we last left off, we were talking about uh, laminate theory. We had kind of defined what a laminate was, how we define the case layer, how we define a stacking sequence, all that sort of good stuff. OK. Um, and when we left off, I told you that we were going to look at defining the strains in this laminate here. And what we're going to do is a theory here called plate theory, where we're looking at sort of complicated deformations and loads that develop inside of a laminate and ultimately relate the strains that we can sort of predict using plate theory back to loads that are originally applied to the composite so we can develop some sort of relationship between loads which we might apply and strains which might develop a sort of like pseudo hooks law for the situation okay and jonathan is joining us okay so last we left off we were looking at this particular laminate here. Hopefully we all had kind of like drawn this picture because we're going to talk about this picture quite a bit today. And we're looking at how do I develop strain as I go from B to B prime, where B is like this point that's randomly somewhere in the thickness of this laminate in an undeformed condition going to B prime, which is sort of in this deformed state. OK, so um, what we talked about was sort of the strategy for what's going to come up here. We're going to start with this general plate. And we're going to define the strain at an arbitrary point. So again, that's kind of the strain at some random point in the composite. That's point B going from B to B prime. All right. We're going to assume the strain is continuous through the laminate. So we have no discontinuities in the strain as we move from layer to layer. This is a pretty big assumption of plate theory. It's not really what happens in reality, but that's what we're going to assume. OK, so if we assume that the strain is continuous through the laminate, then we can determine the stress in some particular layer given a strain distribution that we have using something like this Hooke's law that we developed for singular thin lamina, right? You can apply it to the kth layer to get the stress in the kth layer, right? After that, we're going to add up all the stresses that are sort of along one of the edges and say that all the stresses that are on one particular edge must be equal to the forces and moments that we applied along that edge, sort of an equilibrium. Doing an equilibrium balance here by integrating the stresses over one face over the area of that face, saying that that must equal to the forces and moments that we applied. This general idea that whatever stresses we develop in the laminate has to be equal to the force divided by the area on that particular side. This gives us a relationship between the forces and moments that developed, the applied loads, 
in the original strains that we have in the piece to give us some sort of like pseudo hooks law between forces and moments we apply multiplied by something gives us strains on the laminate. All right, and we'll see that sort of develop here. That's the whole idea. OK, so <clears throat> let's do it. We had some assumptions that we were making here. Um, I'm not going to really beat these to death, but uh, each lamina is thin. Displacements from the delamination uh, from the deformations are small relative to the laminate dimensions. So we'll use U, V, and W for displacements in X, Y, and Z. It's more on that in just a second. Strain distribution is continuous through the laminate. So we sort of talked about this, even though you know fibers and material are not necessarily continuous in various directions because we have multiple layers. We're going to assume that our strain distribution is more or less continuous. Displacements vary linearly through the laminate, and so this linear distribution here as we bend this guy is what we're going to assume, even though in reality it has a general sort of like warping behavior. We're going to assume here this general theory. This is sort of the, you know, the Eulerian analogy. It's called Kirchhoff theory for plates, but it has an Eulerian sort of like beam analogy. All right. Transverse shear is zero. This is just kind of an assumption of thin materials. It comes from like our plane stress assumption um, that these autoplane shear strains are going to be zero. No plasticity is developing. OK, so again, we're generally small loads. Um, vertical displacement, not a function of thickness. We'll talk about where this occurs. All right, so all that sort of laid out. All layers perfectly bonded, bonded, perfectly bonded. OK, so quickly, I just want to refresh how we get strains. Uh, with some arbitrary material. And so here, quickly review axial and shear strains in 2D. And then we're going to use the concepts of the two-dimensional uh, derivation uh, in our plate theory. So if you have some bar, guy walks into a bar. <laughs> no, not that kind of bar. OK, you have some bar that exists in space and you're looking at some element on the surface here. And we have some coordinate system that's like X, Y. This is a 2D element on the surface. Let's do a refresher of how we might define strains for this guy, something you should have talked about in, in your ME 3005 class. So the idea here is if we blow this up, we're going to have some X, Y coordinate system. And we have some original element that looks like this. And it's undeformed. OK, and sort of the X dimension of this particular guy will label with something like DX is this length here. And the Y dimension is DY. Hopefully this isn't too foreign for all of you. And now we're going to deform. Still going to have our XY coordinate system. And we're going to go into a deformed state. I'm really going to exaggerate this uh, pretty significantly. OK, this is like a really large exaggeration, but it's just kind of, you know, sort of proving the point. And we might have elongation of this guy where we have this new dimension that's DX. Um, plus delta x. OK. So we might have elongated some amount in the x direction just from some axial strain. So think of just like pulling the bar, you get some elongation, which is like this delta x. And you might have some higher dimension here, which is going to be dy plus delta y, which is this sort of new dimension here. And additionally, you're going to form some angular displacements that occur here and here, where each one of these guys, let's see if I can get this out here, is sort of like your gamma xy. This is actually gamma xy and two. This is, so remember that pesky um, factor of two that floats. Here, this dimension is delta y. Remember here, this dim dimension is like delta x, this guy here. Okay. So our 
shear strain that generally develops is something like the assuming small angle delta x on dy plus delta y on dx. Right? So the whole angle for this gamma xy, if we assume small angle, so uh, we're assuming tangent of angle is equal to angle, um, maybe I should make that a little bit more clear. Might be a little more clear if I do this. Oh, sorry, delta x on dy. Okay, so that's this guy here is this angle. Maybe I'll do that in red to highlight. This angle is here. This angle is here. Okay, so if I assume small angle, then the shear strain that develops is just delta x dy plus delta y dx, okay? If we let some stand-ins here occur, uh, instead of writing delta x, delta y, we'll use variables u and v. So if you let delta x equal little u, or maybe let's call it delta u. No, let's call it, let's call it u. And let's let delta y equal v, some displacement, and u and some displacement and v. And you're starting in the x direction, which is your final minus your original length, is just this delta x on dx, the amount that I extended in x, divided by the original length in x. Strain in the y is the amount that you extended in y divided by the original length in y. Each of these in differential form. So this is like as dx or dy goes to zero, you're gonna see this as like partial x, I'm sorry, partial u partial x. And your strain in y is partial v, partial y. And this is getting into three dimensions now because we're using partial derivatives. We're just really interested in one particular direction for the axial strains. And it's similar for gamma xy taken in the deferential. And you'll have that your shear strain gamma xy is something like partial u partial y plus partial v, partial x. These are the big boy definitions of shear strain. If you go to graduate school, you'll see these forms of axial and shear strain definitions if you do any advanced level solid mechanics, right? What is the change in the displacement in the x direction divided by the original length in the x direction, right? What is the change in the displacement in y divided by the original length in y? This is just in the very small differential type form. The shear strain here, this is what is sort of like this angular measurement of the displacement of x relative to the original length y plus the displacement in y relative to the original length x. This is how we define shear strain in the big boy terms, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply these general definitions to this plate that we've drawn. Apply to plates. All right, so let's do that. So I'm going to bring this picture back in. Maybe you want to redraw or maybe you want to kind of keep this in mind for your picture that you had previously but we're gonna use this quite a bit, all right? So reminder that this is undeformed and this is deformed. All right, so away we go. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna assume 
and take a look at what's happening at point C. So point C is at the midplane. All right, let's first take a look at what's happening at the midplane because we know at the midplane there's no deformation that occurs from bending. So it's going to make our lives easier if we first examine point C. So first, point C, which is that midplane. All right. The original coordinates. Okay. For point C. We're at some original location, which we'll call X, Y, zero. Since we're at the midplane, we have no Z dimension at point C. All right. Remember, our coordinate system emanates from the middle of the laminate. We're going to say that this point C, which is sort of right here at the midplane, is deforming to this C prime, right? So we can see from the figure here that C is deforming out by some X dimensional value, U naught, and it's deforming upward by the value W. This is the displacement in sort of the Z direction. We're going to assume that it also could displace in and out of the plane. We can't really see the third dimension, the y dimension. We'll assume that it also can deform in and out of the plane in amount v0. So the deformed coordinates let's call it c prime so we kind of stay consistent with the picture, is whatever the original length was, it, it was originally at point X, and now we're going to add to it the deformation that occurs here, and we're going to call this U0, the deformation at the midplane in the X direction. So it's extended some amount U0 just from axial loading somehow. Okay, same thing in the Y direction. And then it's also extending up some amount in Z, we're going to call it W0. It's the displacement of the midplane upward from some, some kind of like curvature that might develop in the laminate. Okay, so generally the amount that C has displaced to go from its original to its final condition is wherever it ended minus wherever it started. So the displacement which we'll label as delta sub C. Here, this is going to be wherever it ends, C prime, minus wherever it started, C. Okay, so that pretty obviously is going to be U0, V0, W0. It's got some displacement in X, some displacement in Y, some displacement in Z. Okay, we're going to come back to this, so keep this in mind here. This is sort of our kind of baseline. How much is the middle of the laminate deforming? We're going to call it U0, V0, W0. OK. We'll also know, notice now that the midplane here, because of some curvatures that have been applied, now has some slope to it. some non-zero slope. Okay. We're going to investigate what the slope is at point C. <clears throat> and we're going to call this angle alpha X. All right, this is also available in your figure. I'll give you a second to copy this down and then I'll show you what I mean in the figure. Okay, so here's the angle that I'm talking about, alpha X. Okay, at C prime, we now have this like curvature that's happening from, I don't know, let's say some bending moment that's being applied. And so this angle here now that we have is alpha X. We can define what this angle is sort of using our trigonometry. 
here this is going to be whatever displacement upward we have, this W will be the numerator. And then the original length in X will sort of like be the, the denominator, right? So the angle that's made is that W over DX. Right? So this angle alpha X is just going to be this change in W over the change in X or in differential form, partial W partial x. How much do we displace in z as we move along the x direction given some curvature that we have on our piece? All right, so it's just like the slope of this particular line, right? If w is like your um, elastic curve function, hopefully you talked about elastic curves in like 2004, all right, this is just partial of your elastic curve as a function of x. Okay, a small angle. So we're assuming small angle. Tangent alpha X is approximately equal to alpha X. And so we can say then that alpha X is just equal to partial W over partial X. This is this angle that's formed at that particular location. Right. We saw this in the x direction. We could equally have some curvature in the y direction, like into and out of the plane could have a very similar thing since we're talking about plate theory now. Except now here it's not partial w partial x, it's partial w partial y. So this idea of how much is this laminate deflecting upwards as I travel along the length of the laminate in the y direction? How much is this laminate deflecting upwards as I travel along the laminate in the x direction? Right? These are these values that we're sort of working with here. This is the angle that's forming sort of at this midplane. OK, so why is this particularly helpful? All right, well, this is helpful because we need to define not the displacement at the midplane, but the displacement at some arbitrary random position, which we're calling point B, as B goes from B to B prime. And to do that, we need to know the angle between point B and where we are at the midplane at point C prime. So here, we've sort of established what we want to know about point C. We need to now move on to what's happening at point B. After deformation, goes to B prime. Okay. And what's going to happen is we originally start with sort of this configuration of B relative to C, where they have some distance between them, which we call ZB. All right, that distance ZB does not change as this deforms. That was one of our assumptions. The relative distance between point B and point C does not change. This laminate does not deform in the Z direction in any way. All right, um, it doesn't compress in the Z direction. All right, so this distance stays the same as this laminate deforms from ABC to A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime. So the distance here between point B prime and point C prime, this distance here is generally going to stay the same, and that is the distance ZB, right? So if I want information about how B prime is sort of deforming, what the ultimate deformation of B prime is, I can say, all right, well, I know the deformation of C prime, and I can talk about the relative deformation of B prime with respect to C prime. So that's what we're going to do here. So let's look at generally how B prime is looking relative to C prime to get our deformation of B prime. So in deformed state, you're going to have something here which is like B prime. And relative to that, down here is our midplane point, which is 
C prime. So this is sort of like after being deformed in this general relation, B prime and C prime have this distance between them. I know this like sort of hypotenuse here is ZB. That's the distance between point B prime and C prime, as well as the distance between point B and point C, which we originally had in the undeformed case. And I also know sort of by trigonometry that the angle that develops right here is the angle alpha X. Right. Spiffy. So now I can talk about what is the deformation of point B relative to point C? So we call that the displacement of B relative to C. Those of you that have had me in like 2003, this is very familiar nomenclature from you, for you. Even of those of you in 3005, you've probably seen this nomenclature. This is the displacement of B relative to C. So here, the X direction here, B relative to C, I've gone like backwards in the X direction. So I have something like negative ZB sine alpha X. Okay, hopefully we all see that. I would have a similar looking relationship into and out of the plane for alpha y. So if you thought about like how this might displace into and out of the plane as well, I'd have to sort of think about a three dimensional situation, but also in the y direction, zb sine alpha y, that's how much I've displaced into and out of the plane. And then finally, I have to think about um, what's my displacement in this general direction, this like Z direction. And it's a combination of sort of this length that you see here, but also you have to resolve not to just the, the, um, the Z direction from the X displacement, but you also have to um, project to the Z dimension from the Y as well. So you're gonna see here, what is ZB times cosine alpha X times cosine alpha Y? We need to project from both the X direction, which you see in this figure, and also you need to project from the Y direction, which is kind of into and out of the plane, into and out of the board. All right, you can make some small angle assumptions. Remember for small angle that sine alpha approximately equal alpha. And cosine of a small angle is approximately equal to one. Okay, so with that, this guy just goes to one, this guy just goes to one, this guy goes to alpha y, this guy goes to alpha x. So my displacement of this B prime relative to C prime, I guess they should both be primes. Is gonna be something like negative Z B alpha X. That's sort of how much I've moved from B prime relative to C prime in the X direction. This is negative Z B alpha Y. And in Z, we just have this ZB value. Finally, I want the total displacement of B prime. So my total displacement is going to be whatever displacement I had B relative to C minus whatever displacement there was at point C. All right, this is just my general relative displacement equation. 
Uh, that that should that should actually be the other way. This is delta C minus. Well, let's actually do this correctly. We'll do this fully. All right. So the displacement of B relative to C is equal to the displacement of B minus the displacement of C. So ultimately, the displacement of B is equal to displacement of B relative to C minus the display plus the displacement of C. There we go. That's the, the real relation. So I'm looking for the displacement of point B. Because I want the strain at an arbitrary point. And so to get the strain, I need what is my displacement versus my original length? OK. So my displacement at B. This is my displacement of B relative to C. So this is this negative Z B alpha X. I'm going to add to this my displacement of point C, which I know was E zero. That comes from all the way back up here. So my displacement of point C, that's the displacement of the midplane. So this is the displacement of B relative to C, and I'm adding to that whatever displacement I had at the midplane. So this is displacement of midplane. And here this is the displacement of B relative to C that comes from curvature of the laminate. Okay, so hopefully we're all kind of following that. Okay, so I'm going to rearrange. And we're going to let alpha x equals, uh, what was alpha x? Uh, partial w partial x. And alpha y is partial w, partial y. And we'll finally define the displacement of point B. which we're going to call UB, VB, and WB, of the X direction displacement of B, the Y direction displacement of B, and the Z direction displacement at, at B is going to be equal to U naught, whatever the midplane displacement is, minus the displacement that comes from curvature. This is ZB alpha X, but we're going to write this now as partial W partial X. In the Y direction, it's V0 minus ZB partial W partial Y. And finally in Z, the midplane displacement plus whatever distance Z was originally from point C. So here's your full displacement of point B. Okay, why do we do all this nonsense? <laughs>
All right, so again, mid-plane displacement, mid-plane displacement, displacement that comes from curvature of the laminates. So again, these guys are all mid-plane displacements, all these terms coming from curvature of the laminate. We don't have any curvature influence in the z-direction. All right, so why do we care all about that? Well, because we need to define the strain at an arbitrary point. And to define the strain at an arbitrary point, we need to find the displacement divided by the original length of that point. So now we're going to use our big boy definitions of strain to actually define what is the strain at point B. Okay, so remember, our big boy definitions of strain. Strain in the X direction at point B is partial u, partial x. How much am I extending in the x direction for every length of x that I travel? This is our big boy definition. Okay, well I have this u now. So here's this partial, partial x. Now the definition that we have for the displacement at point B, which is whatever the mid-plane displacement is, minus the displacement that comes from curvature. Welcome to plate theory. Who's scared? Yeah. You guys scared? Distribute. Partial u0, partial x. Minus uh, zb. Um, let's, we could just call it z, I guess. We'll just drop, we'll just drop the, the b. Z for some arbitrary random point, Z. Partial squared, W. Partial X squared. All right. Similar ideas for strain in the Y. What change do I have in the mid-plane displacement for every amount of length that I travel in the y direction minus how much displacement do I have from curvature? So that's just partial squared w over partial y squared. So those are your axial strains in x and y. And lastly, your shear strain, which we talked about before, it's partial u partial y plus partial v, uh, partial x. This is fully giving us the picture of the shear strain that develops. Here you can imagine plugging this in here. And a similar expression into v. You work this, you will get partial u0, uh, partial x, plus partial v0, partial y, minus 2z, partial squared w, partial x, partial y. OK. Let's dive in on each one of these terms a little bit. We're nearing the end. I know you're getting sick of this. Some of you are getting sick of this. Some of you actually might actually enjoy this in a sick, sick, sadistic way. Like me, I, I enjoy this. This guy here, what is this term? The change in the displacement divided by the change in the length at the midplane. This is just the midplane strain. Okay, so this here we will call epsilon x naught. It is the mid-plane strain in the x direction. It's basically the strain of point C, okay, which is sort of in the mid-plane there. All right. Similarly, this is like the strain in the mid-plane in the y direction. Okay, so we can. Um, maybe make this a little bit more clear. 
so you're not you know killing yourself on space. So define. Plane strains as the following. We'll say epsilon x naught. This is the strain in the x direction at the midplane. Is whatever the displacement is at the midplane, the change in displacement at the midplane versus the change in length. So how much am I extending in x as I move along x, specifically at the midplane of the plate? Do the same thing in y. How much am I extending? How much am I displacing in the y direction as I move along the laminate in the y direction? And this one's a little difficult to wrap your mind around, but you can do it. The midplane shear strain. This is going to be partial u0, partial x. It should be partial y. I think there's a mistake in your notes. Okay. More or less, how much shear is developing as I'm moving in either the y direction or the x direction? It's a little bit difficult to wrap your mind around, but how much shear is developing inside the laminate as I move through? All right. Those are my mid-plane strains. Also, let's define curvatures. You've probably already done this in, in uh, your calculus class, defining curvatures of a particular line. Here, this is kappa. Um, I like to just like put a big curl on the top of the K. It says kappa X partial squared W partial X squared kappa Y negative partial squared W partial Y squared and finally kappa XY this shear component I get a partial squared W, partial X, partial Y. Almost done. So in brief, the strain that we have at an arbitrary point in the x direction is going to be whatever the midplane strain is, epsilon x at the midplane, plus the distance that your point is away from the midplane, that's z, multiplied by the curvature in that direction. in matrix form. Here are our strains. A form you're much more used to seeing. Epsilon X, Epsilon Y, Gamma XY. What is the shear strain at this point? It's going to be equal to Epsilon X not, Epsilon Y not. Gamma X, Y naught, plus the distance you are away from the midplane for your particular point of interest, multiplied by these curvatures that develop. Here's the strain that develops in an arbitrary point inside of a plate. 
plate theory is one of the more complicated things in, in mechanics, right? So congratulations for making it to the end of lecture today. Strain at the midplane plus strain that results from curvature of the laminate. This is general plate theory for any thin plate. Notice how we didn't talk about composites at all today. We just talked plate theory, which is complicated. Damn. All right. We're going to take more or less this definition of strain, multiply it by the stiffness of our particular material so that we can come up with a sort of an expression for Hooke's law uh, tomorrow. So that'll be it for today. Um, thanks for coming. Question. What is the advantage to this? Puts hair on your engineering chest. <laughs> so the question is, why do we do plate theory if it's so complicated? Because plate theory is different than beam theory. I mean, this has roots in beam theory, which things you should have seen and talked about in your 2004 class. Right, things like equation of an elastic curve, um, you know, theta is, you know, basically the curvature of the elastic curve, all those sorts of things. You know, you can use that to predict how much a beam is going to bend, how much moment and shear is going to develop in a beam, you know, all those sorts of things. But you need to have that ability to do that with plates as well. You know, and plates, because they're not thin, don't behave and deform in the same way. Right. So we have to have some way to deal with that. And here we are. <laughs> There's coupling that exists between the X and Y direction for plates that doesn't exist for beams. And you see that here, you know? There are coupling terms here for the shear strain. OK, other questions? All right, that's it for today. Thanks for coming.